Yes, it's OK. Uh, this House do now adjourn. I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I start by saying uh, thank you so much um, for, for granting this adjournment debate, uh, a really important uh, uh, issue. Uh, the first duty of any government, Madam Deputy Speaker, is to keep its citizens safe, and that particularly uh, relates to the most vulnerable amongst us. This evening I want to discuss the deaths of vulnerable Social Security uh, claimants since 2014. That these have been linked to the DWP's actions is a matter of grave concern. They show not just abject failure from the department, but from the government as well. Government ministers set policy and the department implements this. They are culpable as, as well. But it's not just about what policies are implemented, but how they're delivered. And that relates to the culture in the department. Actually, see what um, the speaker is saying. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you. I shall speak up, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, so, as I was saying, the leadership determines the culture in an organisation. The ministers determine this. So, it's not just about the policies and how they're implemented, but the tone and the culture, as I say, uh, related to the delivery of, the, of these policies. We know that the government's health assessment process and sanctions regime leave sick and disabled people in fear and dread as they wait for the inevitable envelope to drop on their doormat, inviting them to participate in either a work capability assessment or a personal independence assessment, or possibly both. Of the, over three quarters of claimants who appeal their assessment decision, telling them that they are fit for work, have the decision overturned. And that's because these are poorly people. We know that the death rates for people on incapacity benefit or ESA, which in 2013 were 4.3 times higher than that of the general population, increasing from 3.6 times in 2003, show the level of sickness and health of this, uh, of this uh, group of people. And peer-reviewed research published by the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health estimated that between 2010 and 2013, Work capability assessment was independently associated with an additional 590 suicides, 280,000 cases of self-reported mental health problems, and 725,000 additional antidepressants groups. These assessments are not only not fit for purpose, they are actually doing harm. Would you like to give way? I will. Okay, anyway, um, can I congratulate Donald Lady and, and Ben so uh, as, as, and, and assiduous in relation to this as well. She's obviously made a, a, a name for herself in this house for her constituents, but also for everyone in this subject as well. Does the Honourable Lady not agree that in this day and age, to have anyone dying in stress and awaiting rightful help and aid from government can be deemed as nothing short of obscene and disgraceful? And the shame of this, there is a shame, impacts upon every person who takes their seat in this place, and that we, what we need is an urgent change in the present system. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with my honourable friend. Uh, he's, a he's absolutely right. This, this shames us all. These are the most vulnerable in our society. And as I say, what, what I will go on to show is how the evidence is revealing that these are policies that have been driven by the government that are having this impact. Five reviews of a work capability assessment over the last 10 years have repeatedly raised issues with the assessment process from medical records being lost to blatant lies in assessment reports. The Work and Pension Select Committee's 2018 reports on ESA and PIP assessments saw almost 3,500 individuals share their experiences. That's an unprecedented public response to a departmental select committee inquiry. But tonight I want to raise a number of cases which have been in the public domain and where the department's processes to safeguard these vulnerable claimants has been an abject failure. On the 23rd of January this year, the Disability News Service brought to public attention the death of Errol Graham in 2018. Just weighing, weighing just four and a half stone, Errol's body was found eight months after his ESA support had been stopped. He was 57 years old. His social security support, support were cut off in October 2017, just weeks after he'd failed to attend an appointment for a DWP fit-for-work assessment. 
He had been on incapacity of benefits since 2003 after his father, who he'd cared for, had died. He'd been reassessed as unfit for work in 2013 and had been on ESA when the DWP called for him to be retested in 2017. Uh, as, the level, uh, as the claimed level of disability was unclear, and that's uh, within their, was contained within their letter. The inquest heard it was standard D DWP procedure to stop the benefits of a claimant marked on a system as vulnerable after two failed safeguarding visits. It made two visits on the 16th and 17th of October. Errol's ESA payment due on the 17th was stopped on the same day. There was no formal requirement for DWP staff to seek more information about Errol's health, for example from his GP, or how he was functioning before ceasing his benefits, and it had not done so, the inquest heard. The coroner's report into his death found that the safety net that should surround vulnerable, vulnerable people like Errol in our society had holes within it. Furthermore, she said, he needed the DWP to obtain more evidence from his GP at the, at the time his ESA was stopped to make a more informed decision about him, particularly following the, the failed safeguarding visits. A consultant psychiatrist told the inquest that Errol was vulnerable to life stresses and that it was likely that his loss of income and housing were the final devastating stresses that had a significant effect on his mental health. His daughter-in-law, Alison, has been scathing, telling me of the anger she and her husband, Lee, feel. She said that what was particularly shocking was how the QC, acting on behalf of the government during the inquest, tried to intimidate not just the family but others as well, shouting at the police officer who found Errol's body about what else he'd seen. And particularly, what offended them deeply was that, the, that he was asked, the police officer was asked, had they found any takeaway menus or any takeaway cartons? It was quite clear at that inquest the DWP was far, and the government was far from listening and trying to learn from this, but they were seeking to blame, which is absolutely unforgivable. Well, my honourable friend, give up. I will. I thank my friend uh, for giving way and I congratulate her on securing this important debate. It's now more than 18 months since Errol Graham starved to death and more than eight months since the inquest into his death where the coroner asked for robust policy and guidance for DWP staff to prevent future deaths. Yet the department's serious case panel isn't even expected to consider the systemic issue identified in Errol's case until next month. Does she agree with me that this inaction means it's hard to believe the Secretary of State when she tells me that the Department took Errol's tragic death very seriously? I, I totally agree with my honourable friend, and I think, again, what I'm going to go on to is showing how this has been going on for years now, and nobody has responded. There have been systematic errors um, that are coming out in, in repeated coroner's reports and other reports, and it's still there is no action. I'm grateful giving uh, way, and I commend the very determined way she's pursued this issue uh, uh, consistently over a long time. Uh, she's talked about the coroners getting in touch with the department. Uh, does she share my concern, as shown in the National Audit Office's recent report, that there isn't a systematic way at the moment of compiling what coroners do say about suicides and other cases that they report to the department on? Absolutely. Again, my, my right honourable friend uh, hits the nail on the head. This is, there are systemic failures within the department, and, and these have to be addressed. This is just not good enough. Jodie Whiting, who is from Stockton, died on the 21st of February 2017. She was a vulnerable woman with multiple physical and mental health illnesses, which left her housebound, requiring 23 tablets a day, uh, and which meant that she was entirely reliant on social security support. In late 2016, the DWP began to reassess Jodie's entitlement to ESA. Jodie requested a home visit as she rarely left the house due to her health, and she had made clear in her reply that she had suicidal thoughts a lot of the time and could not cope with work or looking for work. Despite this, the DWP decided that Jodie should attend a work capability assessment in January. Unfortunately, Jodie missed this appointment and on the 6th of February, the DWP decided to stop the fortnightly ESA assessments which Jodie relied on. 
Jodie was immensely distressed to learn that her last payment would be on the 17th of February. With the help of her family, she wrote to the DWP explaining the severity of her health conditions and asking them to reconsider their decision to terminate her ESA. But this did not happen until after her death. In addition uh, to this, she also received letters to inform her that her housing benefit and council tax benefit would be stopped because they're linked to ESA. She told her mum, Joy, Mum, I can't walk out of the house. I can't breathe. How am I going to work? Just three days after her ESA payment on the 21st of, of February, her last ESA payment, Jodie took her own life. The independent case examiner concluded that the DWP was guilty of multiple and significant failings in handling the case of Jodie Whiting and found that the DWP failed five times to follow its own safeguarding rules in the weeks leading up to her suicide. In addition, a report by psychiatrist uh, Trevor Turney says Jodie Whiting's mental state was likely to have been substantially affected by the DWP's decision to remove her out of work benefits for, for missing a work capability assessment she did not know about. This is now the subject of an appeal for a new inquest to the Attorney General and speaking to Jodie's family today, they are desperate to know when they may hear from the AG about this. And then there's Stephen Smith. Last April we learned that Stephen, the Liverpool man who many people remember on the, on the front of, of various newspapers, and he, who saw, we saw his emaciated body, more reminiscent of some, or someone from a concentration <coughs> camp rather than 21st century Britain, had died of multiple organ failure after being found fit for work. But then, Madam De Deputy Speaker, there are many many more cases of DWP claimants dying, some of whom I raised in last year's, last year's Westminster Hall debate, including Jimmy Ballantyne, who died in 2018, uh, taking his own li life after being found fit for work. Amy Nice, who also died in 2018, again taking her own life after being found fit for work. Kevin Dooley, who died in 2018, committing suicide after lo losing ESA. Brian Bailey, who died in 2018 in July, again taking his own life after being found fit for work. Elaine Morrell, who died in November 2017, taking her own life. Daniela Obeng, who died in December 2017, again taking her own life. Brian Sycamore, who died in September 2017, again taking his own life leaving a note blaming the DWP after failing his work capability assessment. Mark Schofield, who died in July 2017, he was a terminal cancer patient and didn't receive any UC before he died in spite of his illness being known. Chris Gold, who died in October 2017, who was found fit for work following a stroke. He was facing foreclosure when he died and he couldn't work. Lawrence Bond died in January 2017. He collapsed and died in the street after being found fit for work. Julia Kelly, who died in 2015, again taking her own life after losing ESA for a third time. Ben McDonald, who died in March 2015, again taking his own life after being found fit for work. Chris Smith, who died in 2015, he had cancer and had been found fit for work, despite this being a terminal diagnosis. David Clampson, who died in July 2014, he had no power for his fridge to keep his insulin and he died as a result of this. Michael Connolly, who died in May 2014, again taking his own life on his birthday after losing his ESA. George from Chesterfield, who died in May 2014 of a heart attack eight months after being found fit for work, having had pre three previous heart attacks. Robert Barlow, who died in April 2014 of terminal cancer, again die, uh, losing his ESA. David Barr died in September 2014, taking his own life after losing ESA. Trevor Dracard, 2014, died again, taking his own life. Sean Pilkington. I'm very conscious that they, what the Honourable Lady is referring to a number of names. I'm just wondering, when, it, when someone comes to my office or anybody else's office here, we always, when we hear the, the threat to commit suicide, when we hear about the anxiety and depression, we right away say to ourselves, 
these people need help. Is it not time that perhaps government should instruct the office staff when they hear of someone who is threatening suicide or has tried to commit suicide that action must be taken? I think, I think my honourable friend, absolutely. It's unforgivable. These are people's family members and we are failing them. We absolutely are failing them. It, we, we mustn't let this continue. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. Um, she will probably have seen, as I did, the comment in the recent National Audit Office report on suicides, pointing out that internal process reviews are often carried out, not perhaps as frequently as they should be, but are often carried out when a claimant takes their own life. But the department doesn't know whether the lessons from those reviews are implemented or not. Isn't that another pointer to a, a, a dramatic change that's required here? Absolutely. My right honourable friend is spot on. Um, there are so many uh, learning points that we should have already picked up on, um, and I will go through those in a minute. I'm going to finish this list if I can. Sean Pilkington died in January 2014, and Terry McGarvey, who died in February 2014. This isn't an exhaustive list. But it, it does, it shames us all, and it shames the government in terms of the inaction. I, I've raised this so many times over the last five years, and there's been no change whatsoever. For years now, there have been warnings that departments' safeguarding policies just are not working. And in 2014-15, and as a member of the Work and Pension Select Committee, I asked for an inquiry on sanctions policy. And from this, we recommended that the DWP should seek to establish a body modelled on the Independent Police Complaints Commission to conduct reviews of the request of relatives or automatically where no relatives remain. In all instances where an individual on an out-of-work working age benefit dies whilst in receipt of that benefit. Such a model, operated within the purview of the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, should ensure that the role of all publicly funded agencies involved in the provision of services or benefits to the individual is scrutinised so that a learning document can be produced setting out how policy on the service delivery pathway can be improved at every stage. In their formal would the minister like to intervene? I, I, I believe there's something that he finds amusing about this. Okay, I just, I just saw what I could only see was a bit of a, of a smirk. I, I hope that wasn't. But there was absolutely no recognition or acknowledgement of this. It was completely rejected by the government going back to 2015. In 2014, the Disability News Service asked via a Freedom of Information request for the department to publish 49 internal, internal peer reviews into deaths. After nearly two years and following an Information Rights Tribunal, redacted versions were published. It was clear from the limited information available that ministers were repeatedly, repeatedly warned by their own civil servants that their policies to assess people for out-of-work disability benefits were putting the lives of vulnerable claimants at risk. More recently, as my honourable right honourable friend has mentioned, on the 7th of February this year, following a request from the former chair of the Work and Pension Select, Select Committee, the NAO published a briefing report which sets out the findings from their inquiries with the, with the department on the information it holds and benefit claimants who ended their lives by suicide. The NAO found that the department had received nine contacts from coroners via its official coroner focal point relating to suicide since March 2016. Four prevention of future death reports from coroners since 2013, of which two were related to suicide, and investigated 69 suicide of benefit claimants since 2014-15. Uh, These are the quotes from the report, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is highly unlikely, highly unlikely, that the 69 cases the department has investigated represents the number of cases it could have investigated in the past six years. In other words, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We don't even know the actual number of people who've taken their own lives as a result of what they've been through. The department does not have, another quote from the report, does not have a robust record of all contact from coroners. How can that be? This is a government department, for heaven's sakes. The department accepts that not, not all its staff are aware 
of the IPR, that's the internal process review. What's the point of doing them if they are not aware? The department's guidance does not necessarily reflect the full scope of the issues that could trigger an IPR. It is just a beggar's belief. The department told us that there is no tracking or monitoring the status of the re these recommendations. It just... As a result, the department does not know whether the suggested improvements are implemented. Do you not feel ashamed? <clears throat> the department does not categorise IPR outputs to identify larger trends or themes from within the outputs, and so systemic issues which might be brought to light through the reviews could be missed. The NA report found similar conclusions to the Select Committee five years earlier, that lessons had not been learned. This is just absolutely damning. And I hope not just the ministers here are take on board these results, but this is rarely covered in the media, so I hope everyone in the press gallery is going to be reporting on this. This is a scandal, it's a scandal. These are British citizens who are dying as a result of policies implemented by this government. Everybody should be taking note. I've asked for a full and independent inquiry, given the, the serious failures that, that, have, <laughs> that are quite clear just from the speech I've just given. I appreciate the Minister needs to consult others, but I would like a response by the end of this week. This is too serious to be ignored. The Department has stated there will be a new system of serious case reviews, so who will sit on the panel? Now, uh, will there be independent panel, me uh, panel members and not just DWP employees or contractors? And will they have medical expertise? Will they commit to publishing the panel's, panel's membership in terms of reference? How will the trends or themes to be investigated be identified? How will the recommendations made by the panel be tracked? Will the department undertake to review its safeguarding policies in the round, including the training of staff? In light of the NAO's findings, how will the department ensure its guidance reflects the full scope of issues that could trigger an internal process, serious case review, and that all its staff are aware of the relevant guidance? The death of any person as a result of a government policy is nothing more than a scandal. And it's clear that from the cases that, that uh, I talked about from the NAO report and others, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We don't know what's going on. For too long, the department has failed to address the effects of its policies. It must now act. Enough is enough. Minister Justin Tomlinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I am conscious I haven't got a long time to respond to this very important and serious subject. And I do pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Alderme and Saddleworth, who has clearly demonstrated not only her genuine passion on this incredibly important subject, but has been a long-standing campaigner in this area, highlighting both through her work on the Work and Pension Select Committee, various debates in Parliament, and work within the media to highlight the plight of some of the most honourable people in society. I do pay tribute. We do take very seriously all of the points that have been raised. As I said, I'm conscious of time. If we don't cover all of the things, there will be further opportunities. And day in, day out, Madam Deputy Speaker, DWP as a department interacts with many, many people, around 20 million each, each year, and a number of these are some of the most vulnerable in our society. In the vast majority of interactions with these people, we get it right. The well-being of everyone who interacts with DWP is, is, is of the utmost importance. That is why we improve support and guidance for staff on how best to support vulnerable people and are constantly looking at our processes, striving for continuous improvement. However, Madam Deputy Speaker, we can see that there are cases where we haven't got it right, for which we apologise. When this happens, we want to ensure that the Department learns so that in the future we can deliver the right outcomes first time, respond effectively to the needs of the most vulnerable and reform our service so that we can continually improve and are more responsive to feedback. And I think that was a clear theme of the points that were, were presented in the Honourable Member's speech. And through our work with some of the most vulnerable in society, there is an opportunity for us to make a difference. And both myself and the Minister for Welfare Delivery are passionate about that in terms of identifying vulnerable claimants, making sure there is personalised and tailored support, 
making sure that we are signposting or working in partnership with other organisations to give the very best possible support and, crucially, where things are not right, learn lessons. Now, I'm conscious that with the interventions and the speech, there was reference to the very important work of the NAO, and they've reduced the note related to DWP and the information held on deaths by suicide and benefit claimants, and the Department rightly fully cooperated with the NAO during the creation of this new note, also providing a summary of how we were already working to improve processes in a number of areas. For instance, the Department set up the coroner's focal point in 2016 and is working to improve this, developing better communication between DWP and the coroner's office. This includes informing the coroner of the circumstances in which they should report a death to the Department. The Department is also carrying out a review focusing on strengthening the IPR processes and the Department's response to serious cases and suicides. We are clarifying the circumstances in which DWP should carry out an IPR and improving our internal guidance and communication to ensure all colleagues are aware and understand processes for reporting a suicide. And it is important, Madam Deputy Speaker, to note the IPRs look into detail at specific claimant cases. Often these contain information that is very sensitive and thus should be treated with care. Via the coroner, families of deceased claimants are able to access information from IPRs. If they then choose to release this information, that is their choice, but as a department, it would be inappropriate to comment on the findings of individual case reviews, as this is their private information. We are strengthening the analysis of IPR reports and recommendations to ensure that the department is aware of any systematic themes and issues and is able to act in place, effective corresponding improvements. We are also developing a centralised customer experience team to coordinate all improvement activity, including monitoring the occurrence of issues and delivery of improvements to reduce the risk of issues occurring again. The team will provide a centralised point to support local and regional customer case reviews to identify and act upon systematic issues. And we have developed the serious case panel, which we will consider the most serious systematic issues which have been identified. This will enable the Department to learn from the issues experienced by ensuring there is a forum to make recommendations for improvements across the Department as necessary. And I know that the Secretary of State personally takes this very seriously. And going forward, the Serious Case Panel will be meeting quarterly and any recommendations from it will be taken forward by senior members of the Department to ensure that where an issue has been identified, we will learn and take appropriate action. And for us, we do recognise across the country we do have fantastic, hard-working and compassionate staff, and they are always looking on how they can improve, whether that's through training, increased knowledge or awareness. And we will work with other organisations, for example, on mental health, to improve our awareness and our ability to support claimants. We've worked with Mental Health Matters, who have helped deliver our improved training, and having mental health champions within assessment centres. Last year, we did the very detailed work on domestic abuse, helping to identify and support domestic abuse victims. And we did that with Women's Aid and Refuge, utilising their expertise. On autism, we worked with Autism Alliance to develop the Disability Confident Autism and Neurodiversity Toolkit for work coaches and the Disability Passport to encourage disability, uh, disabled claimants to disclose their disability and health condition early in the process so we can improve communication support and ensure reasonable adjustments are in place. There is still much more to do in that area in terms of identifying all vulnerable claimants, but through things such as universal credit, we have an opportunity to provide that personalised and tailored support and also look where we can identify suitable advocates. So where the system isn't working, there are other people who can help us, independent of us, to make sure that claimant continues to engage and gets the support. I, I have only seconds left, I'm afraid, so I can't take more. There is a real commitment from this uh, department to learn the lessons, to continue to improve the support that we provide to people often with very complex and difficult needs, whether that's mental health, dealing with drug and alcohol dependency, working across government, utilising all of the way to provide that wraparound support, building on initiatives like duty to refer that is so integral in helping avoid people becoming homeless, working within the prison system, having our work coaches in place to put the support ready before they come back out, doing everything we possibly can. There is still more to learn. We have an opportunity later this year through the Green Paper that will look at claimant experience, assessments, 
trust in the system, and finally the national disability strategy the, personally supported by the Prime Minister. The question help. is that this House do now adjourn. As many of us of that opinion say aye.